I am the co-chair of the Coalition of Patient Advocacy Groups, I like to call ourselves CPAG, um, and I'm part of the Brittle Bone Disorders Consortium. And I really would like to welcome everyone this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are, um, to uh, the first in a series of web webinars aimed at helping our patient communities become clinical trial ready. And our session today is titled, An Introduction to Clinical Trials. As I said, today's uh, uh, session is titled An Introduction to Clinical Trials. Um, for some of you, this is going to be a refresher. For some people, it will be new information. Um, and the series is brought to you by, by the CPAG. Um, and it's open to all patient advocacy groups that are part of the RDCRN. So I'm really delighted to see so many people um, on the call today and also really delighted to have such a great speaker. So with that, I'm going to, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Adam Hartman. Dr. Hartman is a program director in the Division of Clinical Research at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke uh, with a background in child neurology and epilepsy. And before joining NINDS, he was an associate professor of neurology and pediatrics at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine with a joint appointment in Johns Hopkins, uh, in the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health Department of Molecular Microbiology and Immunology. So with that, Dr. Hartman, I will turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Tracy. And thank you so much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's always a pleasure talking with, um, talking with everyone who, where I'm trying to share my screen, everyone where this really is going to hopefully make a big difference. The work that we're doing and the work that your consortia are doing as well. Okay, great. So, um, so I assume, can, can you see the Clinical Trials 101 um, slide? Yes. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So <laughs> we'll go ahead. So some disclosures to begin with. Um, as, uh, <clears throat> as you know, I'm a federal employee. I also get some income sources from um, second, second opinion consultations um, that are covered under federal ethics rules. My wife works for Baltimore County and earns income from Johns Hopkins Hospital, but I'm not going to be discussing any unapproved uses of medications, foods, or devices. So our objectives today are to um, provide an overview of the clinical trial process, talk a little bit about, uh, more than a little bit about engaging participants, talk a little bit about some of the clinical trials language um, that you're going to hear. And uh, I guess my first piece of advice is to buckle up because the rocket's gonna go kind of quick. So why do we do clinical trials? Why, why bother? They're expensive, they're complicated. Well, we really need to know, number one, does the intervention, the treatment that's being proposed to actually work? Um, second big question is, is it safe? And we won't go through all of the history, we'll touch on it a little bit, but um, this, this framework, believe it or not, has really evolved over time. When we talk about does it work, there are two terms that you'll hear people throwing around, including me. The first is efficacy and the next is effectiveness. And so when we talk about efficacy, what we're usually referring to is a fairly limited number of outcomes measures in a fairly limited group, a, a highly curated group of participants in the research. Um, so this may be, <laughs> for example, um, you know, historically men between the ages of 20 and 60 uh, in a, you know, in a hypertension trial. The effectiveness term refers more to the real world. And with that comes uh, more patient-focused and patient-oriented outcomes measures, and it also um, usually involves groups that are a little bit less strictly defined, and it's more of the real-world, if you will, approach to what's actually going to happen. A lot of what um, federal agency funds tends to be more in the efficacy domain, although as we're going to discuss later, we really have been trying to um, broaden that a little more to effectiveness as well. Um, we also, one other important concept is that, um, as you, you will talk a little bit about control groups later on, but really it's the comparison that we're using that defines what those results actually mean and the context for how we tend to use those results in clinical practice. The second question is, is it safe? And so this can be very population specific. So unfortunately, for better or worse, and we'll talk a little bit again about the history of clinical trials uh, briefly, but because the populations in the efficacy trials can be fairly narrowly defined, the safety measures also may be somewhat population specific. 
And so we need to pay attention to that because there may be um, trials that you may be involved in where it may be, for example, a repurposing of a drug where a drug had been used for one type of an indication in the past and then someone discovers that it may be useful um, in your particular disease or disorder process and someone may say, well, the safety, we already know the safety of the drug. Well, we may know the safety of the drug in that population, but we actually might not know the safety of the drug in that population. And so we need to be very careful in, when you're reading the literature and, and investigators are describing their studies about safety, thinking about whether or not those findings were population specific and whether or not they may actually apply to your rare disease. The other issue about safety is that, um, as you may know, we'll talk about this a little bit later on, most studies are funded over a short term. Usually it's about five years worth of funding, which means it's anywhere from about one to three or four years of following participants in the study. Usually that only gives us a short term idea of safety. And so one other question that you're going to want to ask is what about the long term safety and, and the long term safety may not be defined. So hopefully by starting off with these two basic questions, the, the, the real goal here, and I'm using uh, Tina Irv's uh, uh, terminology here, is to make you a more intelligent consumer of what's going to be coming at you in terms of interactions with investigators, investiga um, interactions with industry. And so if you start off with these two questions about whether or not something works and whether or not something is safe, and thinking about how that applies to your specific population, um, you're already light years ahead of, of uh, in the thought process. So we'll spend a few minutes talking about the history of clinical trials only because it gives you an idea in what the evolution of the thinking was. So there are a lot of case series reported in ancient writings. Um, if you look hard enough, you can actually read some of this in some of the biblical scriptures as well as some um, Eastern uh, uh, scriptures. Uh, we won't go through that history. One thing that we sometimes talk about in the clinical trials world is the famous scurvy trial. I'm not sure how many people are um, uh, familiar with this, but um, as, a, as an ex-US Navy physician, I take great pride in the fact that James Lind, who is a British Navy physician, um, did a clinical trial that he eventually wrote up in 12 British sailors who had scurvy, which really can be pretty debilitating um, in the chronic state. And he had two sailors each drink either a quart of cider daily, um, some sort of a poorly defined elixir, we don't know what that elixir was, um, seawater, which we presume was probably the control group, a remedy that had been suggested by the ship's surgeon that consisted of horseradish, mustard, and garlic. I can only imagine how that must have gone over in tight quarters on a, on a British Navy ship back in the 1700s. Uh, vinegar, um, which may have been better than some of the grog they were drinking. And then another the final group was oranges and lemons daily, which as you know, has a lot of vitamin C. So as you might imagine, the citrus group did the best. Um, you can criticize this trial for a number of reasons. We'll unpack a little bit of this. Having two people in each group may or may not have been <clears throat> the most um, effective way to study this. However, it may have been all he really had. His results were published in 1753 and 1757. He actually published them years after the study was done. Um, interestingly, the British Navy did not supply citrus to its ships until 1795. So some of you may have heard that, um, you know, it takes about 15 years from the time that, in the, in the modern era, um, from the time that a, a pivotal finding comes out in a clinical trial, and when it actually is implemented in clinical practice. And I guess the only thing we can really say, I mean, for a lot of us, that seems like a long time, but I guess we could say we're doing better than they did in the 1700s. So hooray for us. <clears throat> so <laughs> the other thing that was noted was very poor quality control in pharmaceuticals in the US in, in the 1800s. And now we're gonna focus a little bit more in the US. The American Medical Association at that point decided to have something called the seal of acceptance that addressed quality control at some level. Um, and again, this is really more of a safety issue. In 1906, uh, we had the Pure Food and Drugs Act in the United States. Interestingly, the Michigan Supreme Court in 1935 actually recognized and authorized controlled clinical investigations as a part of medical practice. Um, and there was a liability component to that. And this is where we start to see 
um, a little bit of uh, entry of the word consent into the process, as long as it didn't, in quotation marks, vary too radically from accepted methods of procedure. In 1948, there were randomized, controlled, but not blinded trials of uh, streptomycin and tuberculosis. And over time, the standards really started to improve in the 1950s and the 1960s. I think most people are probably fairly familiar with the thalidomide disaster back in the 1950s. So I won't go through the history of that. Um, but as you know, that was a, a real turning point for um, safety <clears throat> trials and clinical trials in the United States. So what are some of the problems with clinical trials up to that point? So the main thing is bias. And what do we mean by that? So we're going to spend a few minutes unpacking this because, again, as you talk to investigators, as you talk to industry partners, um, these are some of the questions that you might want to think about asking because really what we want to know, again, going back to does it work and is it safe? I'm going to keep coming back to those two questions. These are some of the things that may actually interfere with our ability, we as investigators and as funders, with our ability to really come up with a true assessment of whether or not something works and whether or not something is safe. So the first thing is a control group. So you have to have some sort of a comparison. Um, this may be, um, you know, we talk about placebo controlled trials where this may be um, a group that's getting, you know, a sugar pill or, or something, you know, uh, that's inert. Um, it could be that the control group is the current standard of care. Um, that, that's something that's considered to be a, a valid control. But you want to have some comparison to something in the later stage trials, and we'll talk about different phases of the trials. Um, initially, you may not need a control group, but as time goes on, as you really start to get more serious about moving something to the clinic, you're going to want to have a control group because it could be that you'll find that the control group may actually do better than the intervention group. That does happen. You also may find that there are, if you're going to define the rate of side effects, adverse effects, you need to have some sort of a comparison at some point. And so that's why the control group is important. In terms of observations, you could imagine that if you have, um, if you've spent the last 15 years of your professional career developing um, an intervention, um, and you aren't blinded to what uh, the participants in the study are getting, you have, and in some cases, there may be a financial conflict of interest too, um, you want to have those observations blinded. You want to know that um, the people who are, who are monitoring the trial, both from, a, a, you know, from whether it works, whether it's safe perspective, um, if they know what you're taking, if they know what you're on, if they're trying to guess what that is, that may not be a valid observation in the end. <clears throat> and certainly we're all subject to our own biases um, in that regard. You also want to make sure that there are explicit, explicit inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, we don't want to unnecessarily um, burden the study, you know, have, have, a, have a, an experimental group that's so narrowly defined um, that the outcomes are not going to be useful, but also not so wide that you lose, we think of that signal to noise where you want to sort of hit it, it's Goldilocks. You want to have it just right where you're including enough people with, who are com comparable enough to one another in terms of the pathology of the condition that it's going to be a meaningful result. Um, and so you need, you need to have explicit inclusion and exclusion criteria. You want to have representative study populations and this representativeness may be reflected in um, different mutations within a certain disease. It may be uh, re represented in having enough uh, males and females, depending on the disease. You want to have adequate age representation, uh, particularly if it's a disease that's a chronic disease that where people survive over time. Um, and certainly we want to have ethnic and racial diversity um, as well. The, the study population in a study, particularly the later phases of those studies, really should reflect the population that has the disease or the disorder. Um, you wanna make sure that the statistics are right. Uh, there are a lot of ways statistics, clinical trial statistics really has come into its own in the last half a decade, half a, a century. Um, and you need to have the appropriate analyses. You also, um, sometimes in trials, frequently in trials, we have people who drop out of the study for one reason or another, and there are statistical ways to handle that. Um, so that the assessment, again, is not biased one way or another. You want to make sure that the outcomes measures are pre-specified. And by this, we mean that at the very beginning of the study, the investigators have defined what it is they want to study 
and not go back later on and say, well, we, were, we meant to study this, but actually in the end, we ended up finding this instead. Um, it's okay to have um, secondary outcomes measures, but you wanna make sure that there are primary outcome measures that are defined primarily because the study is powered. In other words, you make sure you have enough people in the study based on those primary outcomes measures. And then finally, publication bias. Um, it's, it's been shown pretty definitively that studies that are positive are published at a higher rate than those that are negative. Um, there are negative studies that are published to be sure, but I think uh, you know, some people refer to this as the drawer problem where uh, the, the uh, negative studies end up in someone's file cabinet. Um, so we want to make sure that when we're referencing literature that we're aware of studies that were published and sometimes studies that were not published. We're going to talk about one mechanism that the U.S. government has set up. It's not entirely successful, but it is um, an attempt to address that issue. So there are different types of clinical studies. There are treatment studies where someone's doing an intervention of some type. We'll talk about different types of intervention. There may be prevention studies. Um, sorry about the dog in the background. There may be prevention studies where you're trying to prevent um, a type of pathology from emerging or evolving. There may be diagnostic studies where someone is trying to um, develop a particular type of a test for diagnosing something. Supportive care, I think, is pretty self-explanatory. Screening studies, health services research. There are certainly basic science studies that are done in our populations um, and device feasibility. So these are, we may be approached by a number of different types of investigators for different types of studies that they want to do. So you'll hear us refer to the phases of clinical studies. These really are based on drug studies. Um, however, people sometimes refer to them also in the context of device studies and behavior interventions. But let's just, for now, talk about what, what this is in the, in the drug context. So you may have heard of a phase one study. This is where typically it's a very limited number of healthy volunteers or people with a disease or condition. It usually, usually is a very short-term study. And really, this is for defining safety. You want to make sure that the intervention doesn't you know, have some major adverse effect and dosage. Sometimes they'll be um, trying to find what the right dose is. There are ways of scaling doses from small animal models into humans, but that really is a first estimation. And so typically in a, in a phase one study, you'll have a range, uh, usually a somewhat narrow range of doses um, that will be, um, that'll be tested. Usually about, usually this phase is fr fairly successful. About 70% of drugs move into the next phase, which is phase two. And so this is usually up to several hundred. Now these are with, I should, define, I should just say this very explicitly. I think this is implied, but let me just be explicit. This is with common diseases. With rare diseases, these numbers are gonna be scaled way back. So for example, in a phase one study, you may have what's called an adaptive design where you have, for example, maybe only three people who receive the first dose. And there will be a rule about if one or two of the three have an adverse reaction, the dose is then scaled back to a lower dose. If they don't have a reaction or if only one of the three has a reaction, they'll move up to the next, the next three will receive the next dose. So there are ways to adapt these to um, smaller populations. So again, the numbers I'm providing here are for, these are off the FDA website. These numbers are for uh, more common diseases, but you, you sort of get the concept that the first part is really safety and dose finding. And then the second part is really the first look at whether or not the drug works. These are efficacy. There's that word efficacy where it's a fairly narrowly defined population. You're also looking for side effects because you're exposing more people to it. Um, generally, these are longer duration studies. Um, for the, the uh, larger populations, about a third of the drugs move to the next phase. I don't think we really know um, because of the way rare diseases trials are done. Sometimes these phases are combined. Um, people talk about a phase one slash 2A study where they start to take a, a brief look at efficacy, a small look at efficacy, and then a, a phase 2B, phase 3 kind of a study. We'll talk about that in a minute. So sometimes these are modified a little bit in the rare disease context. But this really, this phase, the, the first look at efficacy is where most drugs fall, um, fall to the side of the road. In phase three, we talk about a larger number of volunteers, usually a longer duration of the study. And this is really confirming what was found in phase two in terms of whether or not the drug works and whether or not the drug is safe. There also may be a phase four study. Um, and this is um, important because we've seen this with some rare diseases. 
Um, so this is um, safety and efficacy on a, on a much larger scale. Some people also refer to this as a post-marketing study. And a good example is um, with spinal muscular atrophy, which is a rare disease. Um, FDA made its, um, uh, gave a conditional approval of uh, the first medication that we used because they wanted to get more information from the phase four, so-called phase four of the post-marketing study. Um, so, so this actually is terminology that you sometimes will see in the rare disease space as well. Typically in phase four um, and beyond phase four, we talk about effectiveness. So this is where we're moving on to the, the really the more real world situation as we, um, as we discussed. Does the drug work in a wider, you know, a less selective group of volunteers? Um, does it work in the real world? Is it something that, you know, if you have to come into the, uh, into the clinic to get all of the outcomes measures um, collected, you know, every week, that's going to that going to be something that's going to happen in the real world. Is this something with it? You can have different outcomes measures where things may be not quite as uh, tightly roped in. And we also um, frequently talk about dissemination and implementation studies. In other words, is this something that can be, you know, widely implemented by a, a study team that maybe is not as uh, well trained as it <clears throat> would be in the earlier phases where everybody knows every little detail about the drug and it's a very strictly applied manual of procedures and that sort of thing. So can, can this really work? So those are the phases we think about again. Typically that's with um, small molecule drugs, maybe with biologics. Um, when we start talking about other types of interventions, this phase one, two, three structure um, is loosely referred to, but it's not quite as strict. Usually you, you might hear terminology like early phase versus late phase uh, terminology, but it, I think that the, the framework gives you an idea of how things may evolve. So there may be surgery interventions. We certainly um, don't want to um, deny anyone the opportunity to have an operation if that's going to be effective. There's gene therapy and genetic modification trials, devices trials, there may be neurostimulators, there may be pumps that are um, uh, surgically implanted or implanted uh, non-invasively. Um, uh, uh, diets certainly uh, can be subject to this, behavior interventions, um, and a variety of other things. So I guess I, I would encourage you to think broadly when we talk about clinical trials, um, you know, any kind of an intervention could qualify for that. Um, and again, you know, some of these may be, uh, may include a diagnostic component. Um, there's some discussion about, you know, how important biomarkers can be, um, whether, you know, there may be something either a fluid biomarker or an electrophysiologic biomarker that may be a predictor of some other uh, more definitive outcome, and sometimes those biomarkers are incorporated in an investigational way in the earlier phase studies, so usually it's around phase two or the phase two type of a study, um, where someone is saying, so can we use something like, you know, a particular finding on an EEG or a fluid biomarker, something that's in the blood or something even in the saliva that predicts what we're eventually going to be looking at as we go into those phase three studies. The reason that that's important is because biomarker supported studies um, in more common diseases tend to do better overall or more successful uh, than ones that do not involve biomarkers. The reason for that probably is because there's been a more rigorous look at what those outcomes are. So there are different types of designs in clinical trials. There's the single arm trial where you're only giving the intervention in one group. Typically that's going to be an earlier phase study. There may be parallel designs where you have uh, one of two or more groups that are going in parallel for the duration of the study. You may have a crossover where each group, um, you may have two or three groups that are exposed to a particular intervention or placebo, and then they're crossed over. That's a design that is not uncommonly used in the rare disease space um, because you're able to use fewer participants overall because everyone is exposed um, to both or a number of different interventions. There may be a factorial design, and this is where you have two or more interventions. So you have treatment A, treatment B, and so one group, for example, may get treatment A only, one group may get treatment B only, group, the third group gets treatment A and treatment B, and the last group gets only placebo. Um, and if you're getting only A or only B, you're also getting a placebo. So everybody gets two of something, it's just that they're getting 
you know, A, treatment A plus placebo, treatment B plus placebo, A plus B, and then placebo and placebo. So that, that sort of a thing. There are also sequential um, study designs. Again, this is something that you see a little bit more commonly in the rare disease space where participants are assigned to receive interventions based on prior milestones. So uh, we talked a little bit about adaptive designs where if you did well on a given dose, that then may, you may then be escalated into the next higher dose group. You do well in that group, you may be escalated into the next higher dose group. If you're you know, barely tolerating the medicine, but it seems to be working, you may continue in that medium dose group, that sort of thing. So there are different ways, I, I guess I'd encourage you to think a little bit flexibly about different types of designs. There are um, randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials, which are held up as the gold standard. There are actually some problems with that, but those are thought to minimize not only the biases that we talked about in terms of randomization and blinding and controlling, but they also, there are sometimes differences, potential confounders between the two groups, and we don't always know what those confounders are. And so it's thought that the randomized double-blind placebo control also addresses, assuming that that undefined unknown confounder is randomly assigned to both treatment groups. The thought is that that accounts best for those unaccounted for, um, unaccounted for confounders as well. Uh, we've already mentioned post-marketing studies. So this is where something is on the market. Um, you do not have the, uh, the randomization or the, or the blinding, but there are ways actually of um, what we call propensity type scoring there are ways of actually accounting for some of the known confounders. Um, they don't completely address the, the unknown confounders, but again, these may be useful in terms of determining what the real world, um, how things will work in the real world. Some of that is related to something, the next item that we call comparative effectiveness. And this is where you're saying, a good example of this is a trial that we recently um, funded, um, looking at three different anti-seizure medicines. Um, in the setting of people who uh, did not respond to the first dose of uh, rescue medication. And so you may say, we're gonna, everybody gets the first dose of that rescue medicine, and then you're blinded to receive, you're randomized to receive one of the three um, drugs um, in that study. We use comparative effectiveness studies frequently in device, uh, in the device setting or in the surgery setting, because it's really unethical to not treat someone, uh, but what you, how you treat them or what you treat them with um, is really the question, what's most effective for them. And then the other thing, and this is also particularly relevant to the, to the rare disease space, is the master protocol um, type of a study. And these, we're seeing more and more of these come up. Um, you may hear about platform trials. This is where you have, um, an, you have a, a single control group that's shared by a number of interventions. So you have, you know, the first trial is, Drug A versus drug B, drug B does not do as well, that drops out, then it's drug A versus drug C, drug A doesn't do as well, then it's drug C versus drug D, and it's sort of a sequential trial. So there are platform trials. There are um, so-called umbrella trials, where you have a single disease, but you may have multiple um, genetic variants associated with that, and each of those variants may have an individual um, type of a treatment, a bespoke treatment. Um, we see this in the cancer world, but we're using it more and more in the non-cancer context as well. Those are called umbrella trials. And then finally, there's the basket trial, which is um, a number of different diseases that all have a similar mutation. And so you're using um, one drug to treat different, different diseases. Um, and this is something, again, that we're, we're seeing more and more of this in the rare disease space. Um, again, we mentioned earlier inclusion and exclusion criteria. You want to make sure that those are well-defined because when it comes time for clinicians to actually write a prescription, they need to know, did that trial really reflect my patient population? Um, something where uh, patient advisory and advocacy groups can be extremely helpful in the design of a trial, and we really, really, really encourage more and more the participation and the engagement of um, patient advocacy and advisory groups and, and science foundations early in the process, like at the very beginning of the design, and hopefully you'll get some information today that'll sort of arm you with that information. Um, you know, investigators need to know whether or not certain things are reasonable and doable. So if the number of visits is one per day for two weeks, 
that's a pretty big burden if you have, you know, a child who has a lot of medical complexity and, you know, you have to load up the van with the wheelchair and then you have to drive 50 miles to the site. Doing that every day for two weeks is probably not something that's going to be reasonable for you to do when you have, you know, three other kids at home. Um, blood draw volumes is something that um, people are actually pretty good about paying attention to that, but you certainly um, can't suck a quart of blood out of a, out of a baby every day for a week. Um, that's something, again, you know, how many times are you going to stick, stick my child or stick me, um, an adult? Things like scanner time, if someone's doing an MRI study, um, you know, do you really want me to sit, if someone, for example, has mobility uh, issues that they're contending with, um, do you really want to have me in that lying down flat might actually be very uncomfortable? Do you really want to have me in that scanner kind of moaning in pain for an hour, you know, two times a month? Do I really need that? So, so really, um, this is a, an area that's extremely important where investigators need to, need to hear from you about whether or not this is something that's reasonable, doable, because if you decide halfway through the study that this is just, you know, you just can't do it, um, that's a lost opportunity to collect more data. And I think they'd rather have a slightly looser design, a less stringent design, um, in terms of frequency of doing these, you know, doing these studies and have more people finish it um, for a whole variety of reasons. There's a lot of ethical reasons behind that too. Duration of follow-up is also something that uh, where, you know, your input is really, is really needed. And then finally, making sure um, that you have some sort of an understanding about what the statistician was thinking, what assumptions, statisticians always have to make some assumptions about how many people are gonna drop out of a study, um, how many people do you really need, what those outcomes measures really should be at the end of the day. So what do the results mean? So strictly speaking, the results only apply to the population studied. So you wanna make sure that the people who are entering the study are going to be representative enough of the population that it's going to be a meaningful result. Um, there are some terms you may see people, um, you may see in the literature as you go through this, superiority, non-inferiority, and futility. I'll just define these briefly. Superiority is the kind of trial that we've really, most of us think about, you know, drug A is, you know, better than placebo, or drug A is better than drug B. That's the sort of thing that we're, we're accustomed to seeing. There is a design called a non-inferiority design, and this is where there may be a treatment that is, that exists, but there may be a new treatment, a novel treatment for the trial, and it may have, it's thought to have fewer adverse effects or it's thought to be perhaps uh, uh, better tolerated. And so you may want to show that in its, in its efficacy or effectiveness in the does it work question, um, does it work at least as well as that other drug does? It's actually, believe it or not, harder to design a non-inferiority trial because for statistical reasons, you have to define how much better you know, one drug might be expected to, uh, is expected to be compared to the other one. So um, those can be kind of tricky designs. And then finally, there's, um, you may hear about futility studies. This is something that in the neurology world, we tend to use a lot of futility, do a lot of futility trials um, early on. And basically we say that um, a particular treatment has to meet a certain threshold, or it's usually it's in a smaller, uh, smaller study, it has to meet a certain threshold or it's not worth carrying on to that larger study. Um, so that's something that's, that, again, we use this a lot in the neurology world. Um, the cancer people, I think, are using it more too. Um, but it can be very useful and it also is attractive from an ethics perspective in that you're not carrying out some huge large-scale study when you could have had a signal early on that it, this really wasn't going to work. Some of the larger studies, um, and you may see this in the press, um, about studies that have a, a, a midpoint look, an interim outcome where they take a look and see that there will be a data safety monitoring board um, that takes an early look and says, you know, it looks like we're on the right track or it looks like we're not on the right track. And they may, you know, again, this is pre-specified, they may decide to terminate the trial, they may decide an adaptive design trial, they may say it's time to switch over to that different dosing regimen earlier rather than later. Um, so those, you know, can be, again, uh, they're, they're very sophisticated ways of um, determining these outcomes. So I've already alluded a little bit to why uh, patient advocacy and advisor groups are really important, but I want to underscore that, and that's really, this is sort of the meat of the talk. We really think that your involvement as early as possible and feasible is really helpful for a variety of reasons. 
helps with number one, it's, it's, it, you know, it's your body, it's your condition, it's your disease. Um, and so you should have obviously a voice there. Um, but aside from that, it also can help with getting people recruited into that study. If the, if the patient advocacy and advisory groups buy into the study, um, then the patient community is more likely to, you know, volunteer for that trial. Um, it also can provide support for families, as you already know this, I'm, I'm sort of bringing the coals to Newcastle here a little bit. There's, you know, material support in terms of non-medical advice, of specialty referrals, equipment ideas, and suppliers. There's also the emotional component. Um, I have a lot of patients in my own clinic who, you know, when we give them a rare diagnosis, um, feel, inevitably, feel like they're the only one in the world who has this, and as you start to engage them with you know, their um, patient advisory and advocacy group, um, they come to realize that indeed they're not alone. So it's, it's a really critical function. And, and certainly for my patients, it's been um, a huge benefit. It's very critical getting PAGs involved is critical for determining patient relevant outcomes and natural history studies. We're gonna come back and talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. For some clinical research studies, it's actually now required by um, uh, by FDA, Food and Drug Administration, for some of their funding opportunities, and uh, at NIH, some of our funding opportunities, it's actually required that you demonstrate meaningful uh, engagement of a patient advocacy or advisory group um, early on. And the reason that that's important is because you don't want to have, what we're not looking for is a, is a group to come in and say, oh yeah, and we showed them our protocol and they said it was okay. We really want to have some evidence that, uh, that you were involved in the development of the protocol. Um, and there's, you know, no one can underestimate the strength of social media. Um, I want to talk about ethics of clinical trials for just a few, couple of minutes. Um, you know, this goes way back. In 1620, Francis Bacon published uh, the Novum Organon, um, Organon, which argued that scientific research should benefit humanity. It's amazing that it took that long for someone to actually put that in writing. Maybe someone came up with it earlier than that. We also had, after the atrocities of uh, World War II, uh, we had the Nuremberg Code, we had the Declaration of Helsinki and the Belmont Report, all of which over the ages, or I'm saying over the age or the decades, have defined uh, what, um, what is considered to be ethical and appropriate behavior. And yet, despite that, despite having the Nuremberg Code, the Declaration of Helsinki and the Belmont Report, we still have been learning about um, ongoing questionable ethical behavior in clinical trials and their design. So this is an ongoing, it's an ongoing process. Um, the main principles that we talk about are autonomy, beneficence, justice, and non-malfeasance. Um, we expect that there's going to be disclosure to uh, patients and blood relatives of certain types of conditions. This is really in the, in the rare disease space, this is something that is up for a lot of discussion, whether or not it's ethical to disclose certain types of diagnoses um, or not. And I don't, I'm not gonna wade into that um, debate, but this is something that, that just so you know, it is debated <clears throat> within the professional community. Uh, we also debate pre-symptomatic counseling. And these, are, these are really important issues and it, you know, it, it, um, uh, we need input uh, from patient, obviously from patient advocacy and advisory groups. I spoke earlier about the publication bias where what we tend to see is positive studies get published and negative studies don't. And so one uh, answer to that has been clinicaltrials.gov, which is supported by the uh, National Library of Medicine, which is a component of NIH. And um, this um, is basically required for NIH clinical trials, FDA clinical trials, um, and a lot of foundations do this as well require registration of the trial before the first participant is enrolled in the study. And um, if you have not seen clinicaltrials.gov, I encourage you to take a look at it to see what information is there um, and what information is not there. Not everything is there, but it typically um, will list sites that are recruiting for different types of study, um, what the inclusion and exclusion criteria are, a little bit about the disease itself. And so this is really important. The other important component of this is that results of those studies um, starting just recently are now supposed to be published on the website as well. Um, and believe it or not, um, so you have to, the studies that are listed now have to list their, their primary and secondary outcomes, at least the primary outcomes. 
And it's interesting because some of the more high profile journals like the Journal of the American Medical Association, New England Journal of Medicine, actually go back to clinicaltrials.gov. And um, if you try to publish a study <clears throat> as the first publication of that, say the first you know, release of the results, and it's not one of your primary outcomes measures, um, the New England Journal will call you out on it. And they, they may not take the paper. Um, they frequently will not take the paper in, unless it's really just the primary outcomes measures. So this is becoming an increasingly important tool um, it's not perfect, and um, you know it's something that's constantly undergoing revision. Um, the staff has recently been doubled, and so hopefully some you know really good things. I know the the person who's the uh, who's running it, and she's fantastic. Um, she knows there's a lot of work that needs to be done, and you know they need your input as well. Um, a few notes about FDA. I've made some references to some you know passing references to the Food and Drug Administration. As an employee of uh, National Institutes of Health, of NIH, I don't want to speak for FDA, but I will say a few things that are sort of out there in the popular uh, press and on media. As you know, it's a US regulatory agency that uh, was created as a result of a number of mishaps. Um, they, have, they do actually have some funding announcements, particularly in the rare disease space, that require uh, patient advisory group input. They also have a program called the Patient Focused Drug Development Program, and I have the website. You'll have these slides. I'll be distributed. Um, the website there that talks about <clears throat> the PFDD. Um, this is really, uh, you know, when you hear FDA talk about this, what they say is they need to know at the end of the day what to write on that prescription. And if it's not going to be something that's going to be a useful outcome for the people who are most affected by the, the disease or condition, um, then, you know, it's not really a great investment uh, and there are some questionable ethics if it's not going to be useful. Um, so the PFDD is uh, something that really has um, been um, uh, geared largely to the rare disease space. They've done, I, I've attend, <clears throat> been involved in two of these um, and they were just fantastic. They do work with partners from outside the U.S. They do work with the European Medicines Agency and other international agencies. I don't really wanna say much more about it than that because that really should be coming from an FDA representative. But I, I can tell you that there is a dialogue. Um, and I, I can't tell you how formal the dialogue is because I don't know. But. So I wanted to talk a little bit about funding opportunities in clinical research. I'm going to be focused because it's my agency. I'm gonna be talking primarily about the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, however, there are similar opportunities or comparable opportunities in other institutes of NIH. And there also are opportunities that are either similar to or complementary to this in the private funding world as well. So um, as you know, the, the National Institutes of Health is you know, 27 institutes and, uh, and centers. I think everybody these days is probably very familiar with uh, the National Institute on uh, Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Um, but uh, they are, are one of our sister institutions. Uh, NCATS uh, is also the National uh, uh, Center for Advancing Translational um, Sciences, uh, where Tina Irvis is from, is also one of our sister institutes. Um, we all have our own individual way of working through things and our own little quirky way of doing things, but we also uh, work together a lot and spend a lot of time. I actually know there was a time when I first came to NIH where I knew more people in the Child Health Institute than I did in my own institute. Um, I've been around for a little while, so it's, that's changed, but it's, we really do work together um, as much as we can. So just two quick points. Our, you know, the mission of NIH is to seek fundamental knowledge about the nature of behavior of living systems and application of that knowledge. So we have a basic science component, we have a clinical uh, uh, research component, and we also have components that work on the translation from the bench to the bedside and back. Um, so I'm gonna give you an idea of what we have at NINDS in terms of uh, uh, clinical trials. Um, I spoke earlier on the left side of the screen, you know, we, we do have um, some clinical trials readiness, um, funding announcements to help uh, really hopefully improve, and this is really targeted primarily at the rare diseases. Um, to help the, the actual um, early phase trials really succeed. Um, we have, you know, first in human studies uh, covered by our biomarker discovery validation, our outcome discovery validation, um, clinical trial embedded natural history studies and common data elements um, studies. Um, we have, you know, phase 1B we've talked about, I mentioned earlier, the first in the target population. Phase 2A, proof of concept. This may involve the biomarker studies that I mentioned earlier. Again, we have a variety of funding announcements that cover that. 
um, phase 2B, preliminary efficacy, really moving things into the clinic and, and so on. The other thing that I wanted to point out is that we have a number within our institute, a number of networks. So what we noticed a number of years ago was that um, a number of the clinical trials had similar types of infrastructure and it didn't seem to make sense for us to be paying for the same type of infrastructure in different places. So we brought this all into one, uh, under one umbrella and we have um, four networks that we use. Um, Siren is a, a critical care and uh, early ICU network, uh, not probably quite as relevant to the uh, rare disease space. We have Neuronext, and so we have had, uh, now I think it's what, 10 studies approved. Most of the studies for Neuronext actually were in the rare disease space. Um, so this is one, it was not originally designed for the rare diseases, but the rare disease um, because it's a number of sites around the country, the rare diseases really fit well into this um, and have done very well in review as a group. We have StrokeNet, which is, <clears throat> as you might imagine, involved in stroke and some of the rare diseases involving vascular uh, uh, pathology can fall into StrokeNet. And then we have the HealEpicNet, which is addressing the opioid crisis. We also have um, our later phase studies. We have a dissemination implementation. Uh, PAR is a, a funding announcement, a program announcement, um, related to where there's a special review for dissemination implementation. And then our institute has a comparative effectiveness study, and we actually intentionally wrote um, both involvement of patient advocacy and advisory groups into that PAR, and we also wrote in specific language about rare diseases. Um, so um, our institute's definitely interested in this, and I think, you know, the other institutes have, some of these are, you know, the, the dissemination implementation is actually an NIH-wide, um, funding announcement. And so, you know, other institutes have very similar um, types of funding announcements. And there are, again, private foundations frequently will um, have funding announcements that are either complementary to these or that can interdigitate in a meaningful way, cover things that maybe NIH will not cover. Um, so really we, you know, we, we look to that partnership. So here's some uh, uh, resources that uh, may be useful to you. There's the NINDS website, there's the NIH website. Um, there are also, I don't know if you're all familiar with the NIH reporter website, this is NIH wide that um, uh, addresses that, that where you can see what's being funded in different disease spaces. <clears throat> there are funding opportunity announcements for all of the institutes, not just NINDS uh, or NIH at large. And then there's obviously the FDA website. So with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. And I think we're going to um, open it up for questions. Wonderful. Great. So, Tracy, Go ahead, Kristen. You... All right. Uh, Adam, thank you very much. That was wonderful. We really appreciate your expertise in this first, uh, web first in this webinar series. We did get a few questions in advance and uh, um, I will share them with you and then we'll follow up with ones if people have them uh, submitting them in the group chat. And as a reminder uh, to everybody on the call, if you would go ahead and submit any questions you have in that group chat, and then I will read them aloud. Uh, so Adam, we received this question, how does a patient really know what the expectations are of their involvement in a clinical trial? And then secondary to that, if it is a pediatric trial, how does a parent know exactly what is expected of them and who tells them? That's, that's a fantastic question. So um, there is a consent process. <clears throat> so you are supposed to be um, uh, asked permission to involve yourself in the clinical trial. Um, that consent process, typically it's you know anywhere from uh, three or four pages to, you know, hopefully these days we're not seeing as many of the 15 page consents where you read about what the study will provide, what you're expected to provide. Um, there may be a, a small uh, amount of re remuneration to cover parking and things like that. Um, you should ask what the involvement is in terms of time. How many times am I going to have to come back? And this should be outlined in the consent document. Um, how many times you're going to have to come back to the, to the center to get different studies, whether or not you're going to be doing certain types of scales or rating, uh, rating scales at home, things that you're going to observe either about yourself or about your child um, or about your, you know, about your loved one. I mean, this, this applies to older adults too. Um, 
So typically that's going to be embodied in the consent process. The consent forms are, so it's called informed consent. The consent forms mm -hmm. typically are um, overseen. They're created by the investigator team using, um, usually it's standard formatting from the institutional review board that is overseeing the study. So the institutions have uh, review boards, it may be a university-based review board, it may be a commercial review review board um, that's overseeing the study. They have to approve that. Um, at, usually a funding agency wants to take a look at the, at the consent form as well. Um, they're not perfect, but they're usually, the consent form is usually pretty good. If you have any questions about the study, the name of the principal investigator for the study and the local investigator for the study should be on that consent form. And you should be given the opportunity to ask questions before you sign the consent form. So if something doesn't make sense, you know, a lot of times people just come in sort of, uh, you know, slap down the form and say, here, I want you to take a look at this. It's supposed to be read, you know, written in a way that can be widely understood. Um, sometimes that, that happens, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but you should feel empowered to ask questions. You know, the investigators want you to ask questions because, you know, quite frankly, an informed consumer is more likely to follow through on all different aspects of the study than um, someone who feels like they may or may not have been sold a, you know, a load of, uh, you know, something off the internet. Um, there also should be the ability, someone listed on that consent form, and you should be given a copy of the consent form after you sign it. There should be someone, an additional person from the institution who you can contact who is not supposed to be directly linked to the study if you have questions or concerns about the study. Um, for children who are usually around 12 years of age or have the, the cognitive ability of about 12 years and older, um, we usually have something called an assent form. So they have to at least agree to, to be involved in the study. Um, it doesn't have the same bearing as the, cons the official consent form does. However, um, you can imagine if you have a, a uh, teenager, an adolescent, um, who has the cognitive ability to understand what it is that's going on and they don't want to be a part of the study, uh, there are not a lot of PIs who would want that person in the study because they may sabotage it, you know, intentionally or unintentionally. So, uh, you know, you want everyone to be on board. Some questions you want to ask that aren't always outlined on the consent form. Um, you want to know how much time it's going to take to do each of the outcomes measures. You wanna ask about things like, is parking going to be covered? You know, hospital parking can be expensive. You wanna have an idea of whether you're, if you work, um, whether your employer will cover you for that amount of time. I mean, these are things that, you know, again, um, you wanna make sure that the T's are crossed and the I's are dotted because um, you, even though you may be compensated in some sort of a way, uh, you know, a gift card or something like that, um, you know, the, these studies are, it's, it's a real partnership and you do have to invest some time and, and possibly some, you know, a little bit of money in things like parking food, things like that, if it's going to be a day long study. Great. Thank you. I, as a follow on from that, who tells the patient um, who, or the participant, what kind of privacy that they are giving up by participating in a clinical trial? So that again should be outlined in um, very clearly in the um, very clearly in the consent form. Certain things um, can be disclosed, certain things cannot be disclosed. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be a reason for a regulatory agency to have to look at that information. There may be a reason that a funder may have to look at that information. Um, <clears throat> but typically, the identities of, of participants are supposed to be. Um, unknown to everybody except for the people who are directly administering the study. But there should be a legal paragraph about privacy in that consent form. Um, you know, the, these things are covered by HIPAA to a certain extent. So, you know, you have to make sure that you um, understand. And again, if you have questions about that, ask. I mean, that's, it's a, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, this next question is uh, in regard to ethics and privacy. Uh, and what obligations are tied to those who are performing the trials at each level of the process? And what recourse is there uh, if someone violates these ethics um, or, a or a participant's privacy? Yeah, so, um, so again, that goes back to that consent. I mean, I can't tell you how important that consent form mm -hmm. is. 
it goes back to the consent form. And I had mentioned earlier that um, there should be someone, an ombudsman type of a person who you can contact. You certainly, if there's a concern about an ethics violation, you can and should contact the IRB, the Institutional Review Board that is responsible for that study. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, those sorts of breaches are taken or should be taken very, very seriously. Um, it may result in termination of a study, you know, depending on what it is. Um, there may be other, obviously, you know, uh, other steps to mitigate that sort of process. Sometimes it could be that uh, disclosure was inadvertent and it could be that there was something about the process and the way the information is handled um, that may not have been understood. Um, it was initially designed. So, you know, it could be an honest mistake too, but um, again, that's something that, that can be discussed with the IRB or with that ombudsman type uh, person if there's an ethics violation. But, we, you know, we're supposed to be held to strict confidentiality on, on those studies. That's great. Uh, what are clinicians allowed to say about their clinical trial as it is being conducted? You know, is it working? Is it not? The health of other kids? Um, you know, information that might help a uh, parent alleviate concern as they their child is involved in a clinical trial. So really, but what is a clinician allowed to share with a participant? Clinician or, you know, or a yeah. PI. So, so in a blinded trial, they're not supposed to know. <laughs> so that's why I was smiling. Um, you're, you're really not supposed to know what the, what the assignment is. And, you know, yes, people on the study teams play this game where they say, you know, well, you know, the person's a little more fatigued than they were before. I think they're getting the drug or, you know, this person feels, you know, they're looking a little better. I think they're getting the drug. And I think that, um, you know, we all, we all have our own cognitive biases. We all um, want to think certain things. That's how our human brains are wired up. I'm, so I'm a neurologist, so I'll say that. Our frontal lobes and our <laughs> wired up to be generally pretty positive about things or pretty negative about things. So we think what we love to predict and the fact is we suck at predicting. And so, um, so I have certainly been fooled where I've said, I thought someone was on, you know, you say the study court, I think someone, you know, I think this person's on the drug or not. Then you find out when they were not on the drug. And so that's why we do the, you know, particularly in the later phases, um, you want to do that placebo controlled or at least standard of care controlled trial. It's got to be controlled because you have to know the context Again, does it work and is it safe? You want to know the context, the, the control group defines what that eventual result is. Um, mm -hmm. In the earlier phases where you may be defining the dose or you may be, um, you may be defining the dose or you may be um, doing the early safety studies, that may not be, it may not be appropriate for those to be, um, you know, those really should be a single arm. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, the clinician, um, probably is going to know what it is, the, the, the PI is going to know what it is that they're getting. In terms of what they should be sharing, um, you know, again, this is a privacy issue and it really should not be shared by the clinician. Now, that said, um, we've also all been in the situation where, <clears throat> you know, Johnny's mom comes into the office to talk about what's going on in the study and then, you know, uh, Malik's mom comes into the office half an hour later and says, well, I was just talking to Johnny's mom out in the waiting room. And she told me, it's, okay, so the, the answer there, I think, should be if Johnny and Malik's mom have a conversation about something, they could talk about whatever they want to talk about because it's their information, it's their privacy. But I can't be the mediator of that. Now, it is appropriate to say that, um, particularly if you're doing, you know, a dose escalation study, an early phase study, an adaptive design study, it is appropriate for you to ask how's everyone else on this dose doing? The clinician, you know, the investigator may or may not tell you. I think it's, it's fine if you want to ask. They may or may not tell you for a few reasons. One, they don't want to bias you. Two, they may not know. Um, so, you know, and different people may be at different points of the study. So you may be at an earlier stage of the study. If there's a signal, clearly a big safety signal <clears throat> early on, um, then you may, you know, you, you should be told about that. Typically you are told about that. I can't say it always happens, um, but you should know about that. Um, I've been involved in studies where there have been um, big adverse reactions, and these are typically larger studies. And then the question that goes back to the, I didn't talk about data safety monitoring boards. This is typically a, a group of people who are selected by 
um, the investigator or the institution um, who monitors safety, there's typically an unblinded component to that where they actually know what everyone is getting, um, but they don't communicate that to the, to the PI, um, to the principal investigator. Um, and it's usually there's a statistician on those for larger studies and um, they may compare that. I've actually been on a DSMB where we then looked at that reaction, that severe reaction, and compared it to the baseline in that population and found that either it's above the expected baseline or it's at the expected baseline or below the expected baseline. Um, so just because you hear of an adverse outcome, that may or may not, it's important to put that into a larger context. Um, the other thing to think about, and we didn't talk about this during the talk, is, is the risk worth the benefit? So uh, a good example of this is a drug um, that you may be familiar with called fenfluramine, which was just approved by FDA for use in Dravet syndrome. And so fenfluramine, for those of us who are old enough to remember, was part of the fen and fenfen back in the 90s. This is a mm -hmm. pill that was administered. It was fenfluramine and fentramine. And that combination actually ended up with some very bad reactions in adults who were using it for weight loss. Um, the uh, uh, scientific community said maybe the fenfluramine alone may be useful for children with Dravet syndrome in terms of controlling seizures and, you know, sort of improving quality of life. And so it turned out that the fenfluramine by itself actually worked pretty well. Now it's part of a, a pretty strict monitoring program with FDA now, but if you're an adult who does not have an underlying condition, except for maybe, you know, high blood pressure, diabetes, who's trying to lose weight, the risk benefit looks very different than a child who has Dravet syndrome, um, who, you know, the next time they get too hot may die of their, of their seizures. And so it's all about risk and benefit as well. Um, and so again, that's something that weighs into that equation about how much participants are informed and, and how much they're not informed. And the, if it's a, <clears throat> a drug or a device trial, you should be informed about what the anticipated adverse effects are. And if you have an adverse effect, you should be reporting that because <clears throat> the study team needs to know that. I mean, that's, that's part of the whole thing. In the end, does it work? Is it safe? Is the risk worth the benefit? And um, people who have in the rare disease community are generally more willing to tolerate risk. We've seen this from recruitment studies, you know, time and again, are generally a little more willing to accept a certain level of risk because the potential benefit is so great. Right, right. Um, we, there was an excellent question. I wanna remind um, people who are still on the call to please uh, submit your questions in the group chat and we will get to them. Um, this is a great question. This came from Tina. Who owns the data from a study and how much access can we individually expect uh, after a study is complete? And I would add to that, how is it typically disseminated when a study is complete? Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm giggling only because Tina and I have talked about this a million times. Um, and it's <laughs> a really, really important question. And it's one that, um, it's really one that, that, you know, the participant community needs to know about. So um, the first thing you need to know is who is sponsoring the study? Is it a government agency? Is it a drug developer? Is it a small pharmaceutical company that's going to be, you know, might be bought out one day by, you know, one of the larger pharma companies? Is it a large pharmaceutical company? Is it um, a foundation? There are some foundations that actually sponsor these trials, um, some, you know, uh, um, rare disease foundations. So you need to know who the sponsor is. And typically the sponsor has most of the say about who owns those data. And so if you're going to engage in a study, you want to ask this question, who's going to own my data at the end of the day? Is it going to be the federal government? Is it going to be a private company? And, and the, the issue is that there are data sharing requirements that, um, that government funded studies typically have saying that, uh, you know, a company, even if it's involved in the study, can't have full ownership of the data. Um, that, you know, we have to, the, the, if you're using federal funds to do it, you have to share the data. Um, it's de-identified data. It's supposed to be de-identified data. So it could be that you know, we found that people, so when you, you're enrolled in a study, you're given, you know, a study participant number. That number is supposed to be kept separately from your, you know, your name, so they can't go back and identify you. 
Um, part of the problem with rare diseases is that, um, especially the ultra rares, <laughs> is that if there's only 10 people in the world who have that disease, um, you know, again, social media is a, a blessing and a curse. Um, if there's um, only a limited number of people in the world who have that disease, then, you know, it's a pretty good guess. You may have a one in two chance of guessing who those people are. Um, so you want to ask that question about who owns the data, how it can be used. Um, typically, you know, we do get requests, the federal government does get requests from um, companies and from academic investigators who may want to use that data set, for example, to define what the statistical parameters would be for their follow-on study or for an additional study. And so, it's, I mean, usually these data requests are very, uh, we screen them at NINDS, we screen them, I assume the other institutes do too, a you know, little application they have to fill out. Um, about why they want to use it. It's most commonly because they either want to look at a different outcome than, you know, one of the secondary outcomes or something else that they're particularly interested in, or they want to use those data to define some statistical parameters for, um, for future work that they want to do. So it, it's usually, like I said, it's usually legitimate, but um, uh, if it's a company that owns those data, then you may not have full access to those data and uh, those data become the property of, you know, of the sponsor. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did I answer all the components of that? There was a lot that was- You did, that, that was a lot of, that was a, a, a meaty yeah. response. Yes, yeah. a meaty question and response. Um, I think this next question is, is particularly good given that we have uh, patient advocacy group leaders all on this call. And the question is, how can patient advocacy groups working with investigators ensure that patient insights are taken into consideration during the development um, of a trial and development of a consent form. So I missed the first part of that, patient. How can patient advocacy groups working with investigators ensure that patient insights are taken into consideration yeah. in the development of the trial? So, yeah, so, you know, this is a very, um, ideally, this is gonna be a very bilateral kind of a relationship. The, the investigators, the patient community, the, the participant community um, for their work. I mean, you can't just do everything in a mouse model. You need, at some point you need, you know, human genes, human, you know, whatever it's gonna be, blood, saliva, um, cells. So, you know, you, you have a role to play in that and you can ask, you know, is this going somewhere, where, somewhere from a therapeutic perspective and I think it's perfectly appropriate for, a, you know, for a patient advisory group to say, you know, when it comes time to get involved in, you know, therapeutic trials, we want to be in on the ground floor. Um, that, I think that's a, a very, very, and, and I think if you have, you know, a lot of patient advocacy groups have, you know, people um, involved either as scientific officers or as, you know, uh, in their leadership um, who have a, a fair degree, you know, sometimes very high degree of scientific and clinical research sophistication. So it's, it's absolutely legit um, to say, you know, we want to help you, you know, design this study. And again, some funding announcements require it. So I think it's, it's perfectly appropriate. And I would imagine that it's welcome um, to, to, you know, to be fairly assertive about that. You know, if you're involved, there are requirements for who can file an application for an NIH grant and FDA. Um, but, um, and, and usually it's going to be a large academic institution or, or an industry uh, partner. Um, but, you know, there are some patient advisory groups that may meet those criteria as well. Um, but, you, you know, I, I've never seen, so when, a, when an application submitted, it goes through review. It's reviewed by, you know, through peer review. Um, I have never, ever ever, and Tina can jump in on this if she wants to, I have never ever seen an application, a comment on an application come back saying the patient advisory group was too involved in this. <laughs> in converse, where they said they involved enough, but I've never seen someone say, you know, eh, it's a little too much. It never. So I'm not saying you can't be too involved, you probably can be too involved, but uh, right now in this environment, that's not a problem. I don't think with this group we have a problem with assertiveness and wanting to be involved if we know the avenues to do so. Yeah, I, so I think, I think as, um, 
I think if you're engaged with, you know, the first thing is going to be typically is going to be diagnostics. And I think if you're involved in the diagnostic aspects, I think it's always um, perfectly okay to plant the seed and say, as this starts to move into, you know, if we're going to be looking at biomarkers, if we're going to be looking at, um, you know, uh, outcomes, patient recorded, out, reported outcomes measures, patient relative, patient focused outcomes measures, mm -hmm. I want to be involved in that. I, you know, please. I mean, you, it actually helps them do some of the legwork. And if they can say, you know, one of the things that NIH applications are currently graded on and, and FDA too is significance and relevance. I mean, if it's relevant to the patient community and they have a letter of support from you and you can honestly say we're involved, we've been involved with this investigator for, you know, the last 10 years, we've had this conversation ongoing for the last five, reviewers see that, it's powerful. Great, um, great. thank you. So this is a this is a kind of an in deep question here um, from John Kimmel. I uh, what are your thoughts on using an individual's own baseline assessments that have perhaps been measured over a period of time as their control for a gene therapy clinical trial on an ultra rare disease, which have wide variability in the natural history course and a matched control group is not possible. Yeah. So, um, so you may know there was a, <clears throat> a study done recently um, published. It was published, well, it's not that recent anymore. A couple of years ago in the Journal of Medicine on an ultra rare disease um, that sort of fell into the Batten disease, uh, which is a neurodegenerative disease involving seizures and, and uh, neurodevelopmental, really loss of milestones, um, cognitive milestones, motor milestones. Um, and that was an ultra rare disease. And uh, they looked at um, the investigators looked at what this little girl's pre-treatment baseline was, and then they looked at her seizure frequency fell and her, uh, you know, her development um, sort of plateaued, improved a little bit. So that kind of a conversation is one that typically an investigator is going to have with FDA, with the Food and Drug Administration, because if the drug is going to go for approval, um, you do, so the one thing we didn't get into was um, investigational new drug designations or investigational device exceptions. Um, so in order to do a study involving a treatment, um, depending on the type of treatment, particularly if it's going to be a drug or gene therapy or something like that, there are other um, approval components to it that may involve FDA or other federal agencies. And so um, typically what happens is the investigator engages FDA in a discussion about what would be accepted for a so-called registration trial. In other words, at the end of that study, FDA is going to say, yes, you know, we'll, we'll approve a label for that, or no, we won't, uh, based on the data. So typically, you, you, don't, you don't want to do one type of study design and then take that to the FDA, and FDA says, well, that's not really what we were looking for. So, so FDA typically meets with investigators early on in the process. And so that kind of a discussion about um, baselines for ultra rares um, and self, uh, you know, self comparisons is something that um, typically would be a part of that initial discussion between the investigator and FDA. Um, and sometimes it is what, you know, it, it, sometimes it's all that you have. Um, FDA recently has been talking more and more about the importance of placebo controlled trials in rare diseases. Um, and so the question is, you know, should the, the question in the investigator community is, you know, do we, how many people do we really need to use to, you know, in the, as participants in the earlier phase studies because we really want to save them for the later phase studies and there's that sort of that tension, that trade-off. Um, and that's one that the, the patient advocacy groups are very involved in um, because you don't want to be involved in a study for one drug and then the requirements for the next drug, we're seeing this a lot in the spinal muscular atrophy field where there are multiple drugs that are um, that have been approved and um, are being investigated. If you participate in one study, does that make you ineligible for another study? Um, and for the ultra rares, the question is even more so. And if you talk about a baseline, the question is just participating in one study, reset your baseline for the next study that you might participate in. So again, FDA is typically a part of that discussion. So, you know, theoretically, it's a perfectly acceptable way to do things, but um, mm -hmm. You know, ultimately, we're looking for FDA approval, and so uh, you know it's, it, the FDA has to take a look at that, and and typically they engage in that conversation early with the investigators. 
last uh, submitted question, unless we hear some more, but I'm wondering um, if you want to kind of wrap up with any, here's your nuggets, so, you know, gold nuggets um, uh -huh. of information uh, or a, a, you know, final advice for leaders of patient advocacy groups. Is there anything, uh, you know, you'd want to share with us? Yeah. So, um, so first of all, thank you for, um, for the invitation to speak and thank you for everyone who attended for your engagement, um, because if you're engaged, you're not engaged. And, um, you know, I've, we've talked a little bit about assertiveness. I'm, you know, Kristen tells me that isn't a problem with this group, which is always a good thing. Um, that, but that, look, I mean, if you want to have a meaningful relationship and a meaningful partnership, it, you know, it takes, it takes more than two to, you know, two, at least two to tango. Um, the other thing is, I think if you, if you can use, hopefully, some of the information that was included in the slides, start off with the whole idea of, does it work? Is it safe? Um, you know, safe comes first. And then drilling into those questions about how we know it works, how we know it's safe. I think that's, you know, in the whole risk benefit issue, I think that's not a bad um, North Star to have. And then all these other things that I discussed, you know, to, to you know, quote a, uh, a Talmudic scholar, the, you know, the rest is commentary. Um, so you want to you want to have um, you want to have hopefully an open and um, friendly relationship with the investigator. They want your help. They need your help, um, and you you need their help. You know, it's it's you know all boats can can rise on this. So enough attitudes and you know corny uh, dad joke reference. I know it's wonderful. Well, I would like to thank you for your time and your expertise and sharing it with our uh, patient advocacy groups. I think this is really valuable and I really appreciate you.